Profesora Vallet Regí, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. A continuación vamos a tener el privilegio de escuchar al padre de la química supramolecular, nada más y nada menos, Jan Marie Len. Len recibió el premio Nobel de Física en 1987 por su trabajo sobre la base química del reconocimiento molecular, es decir, cómo se reconocen y se ligan las moléculas de forma selectiva, algo fundamental en los procesos biológicos. Su trabajo le llevó a definir la química supramolecular o la química más allá de la molécula, centrada en las entidades complejas formadas por la asociación de dos o más especies químicas. Species. Urratzak, materia His talk today is entitled Steps Towards Complexity. Yes, today um, he gave the same talk at the Eskandampana in Bilbao. And uh, tomorrow he will be running a training course with doctoral students at Miramar Palas and on Friday he will participate in a meeting with students. Really, I'm going to be making friends with this visit. A warm round of applause, please, for Professor Lenin. Good evening. I don't see much, but I see you just so. Uh, this is a fantastic time again. It's not the first time I was at this meeting, at this congress, at this passion for knowledge. And uh, I think we should thank the person who has started it, Pedro Echenique, and all the staff who did all the work for making it better and better and better every session. So. My talk has to do with what chemistry is doing in everything that we have heard about. The previous talk was very chemical. So which, what are the steps towards complex matter? Chemistry are main steps in that. And it started very early on in a big bang. At that stage, after the Big Bang, the universe inflated, became very big in a very, very short time. And then, progressively, the temperatures went down, particles formed, and at the age of physics developed no chemistry. The conditions were not correct for chemistry. Particles formed, they formed atoms. Atoms then got together to make molecules, and then chemistry started. So the age of chemistry is the age following that of physics. That the evolution continued and molecules became more and more complicated, larger, and they formed aggregates. They uh, formed also compartments. And then a new property appeared, which we don't know yet exactly how it happened, but there's just another meeting going on on the origin of what we call life. Life on Earth appeared about there. That's the age of biology. But luckily, life was not the final property. The final property of interest is the one which makes us be here, which is thinking, represented by this famous statue of uh, Rodin, Auguste Rodin, the thinker, and that's steps towards complex matter. And one individual we might consider in that is this one. Are you complex matter, Pedro? <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> yeah, you're a bit complex, I know. So, <laughs> this is not a dark slide. It's stuck, but it's not the reason, it's not a bad slide. We know nowadays, from many ex uh, observations, that the universe is formed of 68% of dark energy, 27% of dark matter, more or less. That means 95% of darkness, very dark, but 5% of visible matter. And that's the matter that matters. That's our matter. We are part, we are just part of 5%. But this 5% can
can try to understand the 95 which are left there. So evolution came from divided matter, then condensed matter, then organized matter, then living matter, then thinking matter, thinking matter, and something else after that, maybe something beyond our own thinking. Very difficult to, understand, to imagine what it can be, but we cannot exclude it. And this is the step towards complex, more and more complex forms of matter. Then we have a big question to ask, a very big, very fundamental question. How can matter become complex? from elementary particles to a thinking organism. And are they perhaps even higher forms, higher, more complex forms of matter? To give an answer to that, mankind on our planet, this piece of dust in our universe, has created what we call science. If you just look at three pillars, or three parts of science, physics deals with the basic laws of the universe. Everything depends on these basic laws. Everything is dependent on what, how these basic laws operate. Pardon. Biology deals with the rules of life. They are not laws, they are rules. The laws are already given. So what is chemistry doing? Chemistry is trying, and you have probably guessed what has happened, to build the bridge between the two. How do you go from very general laws to a specific expression of these laws like a human being on our planet. And of course, there are many other planets, and there are very probably many other living organisms on other planets. How does this happen? We can look at it from our point of view, from our piece of dust sitting in this enormous universe. And one may say that the answer to the question is, at least I give that answer, self-organization. That means that our universe is constructed in such a way that it will self-organize somewhere. Not everywhere, but somewhere. But it can even go in terms of, let's say, philosophical outlook, one step further and say that it's a cosmic imperative. That our universe has a structure such that life will not be an accident. Life will be an imperative. It will be a consequence of the structure of our universe. Now, our universe is made of bricks. And these have been analyzed over the years and have knows that there are a number of bricks making up this visible matter, this 5% of visible matter. Here you see the table. So you all here are part of this organism, thinking organism, which was able to put together the bricks which make up visible matter in our universe. There are no others. I'm very astonished by that, and also uh, I'm uh, not so happy about it, because it looks like it's limited, but this is the table of the elements, and an element in here on our planet will be the same somewhere else, far, far, far away. So this is the Lego set with which visible matter is constructed in our universe. It's because of that that we know when a water molecule is present on another planet very far off, we can know that it is a water because it has the same properties, the water molecule. And that's the playground of chemistry. Chemistry is, uh, chemists are like children. They like Lego, they put things together, they make constructions, and there's enormous number, of course, an infinite number of constructions one can realize, and some are realized already, these are the ones we find in nature, others await to be made by mankind or by others on other planets. So from the atom to the molecule, taking bricks, taking atoms, putting them together, making molecules, houses, molecular chemistry has started. By linking these atoms together strongly by what chemists call covalent bonds and this then led to this great variety of molecules which make our, our bodies. We have heard some in a previous lecture, many examples of uh, materials. And uh, of course, there's a very infinite variety of them. If you want to look at two milestones, I would just like to show you two milestones how this has evolved. In 1828, man is considering that that's the time where more or less uh, the art and science of making molecules from atoms has had the first step of importance. 
when Friedrich Wöhler in Germany made urea from another chemical compound called ammonium cyanate. Now, don't worry about the name, but ammonium cyanate is not contained in living organisms. Urea is contained in urine. At that time, people were thinking that in order to make in the laboratory anything which was present in a living system, you had to use a, a magical force called the vital force. Wöhler, by making from ammonium cyanate, which is not contained in organisms, urea showed that this was totally wrong, that molecules are molecules, if they are in a living organism, or if they are inorganic or not living, it's just the same. So life has nothing special. The building blocks of life are normal molecules. 150 years or so later, this very big molecule was made in the laboratory by putting together the right atoms in the right position, and stepwise, it took two groups collaborating across the Atlantic, Robert Burns Woodward in Cambridge, uh, at Harvard, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Albert Eschenmoser in uh, Zurich, at ETH, Polytechnical School in Zurich. That's a much, much more complex molecule than urea. It took many, many years, many, many people to build it up progressively. I was one of them to work at that time. I worked with Woodward. And so uh, this built up and was realized. It looked at that time like the Everest of the art and science of making complicated molecules and vitamin B12 is present in our blood. Of course, since that, molecular chemistry has become more and more evolved. It has become, has had new reactions, made new products, new drugs, new materials, and so on, and it will continue for many, many, many years. But we can have then a question to ask. We can say, what else? What is there something else we should like to study beyond what molecules are. And here one can illustrate it in the following way. Here you see a blue ball, which is a cancer cell, and two uh, purple entities, which are killer cells, which are part of our immune system. These killer cells have to find the cells which have become cancer cells and to destroy them. How do the killer cells know that the other one is a cancer cell? If they make a mistake, you have a big problem. Either you destroy a healthy cell, or you destroy, you do not destroy a cancer cell. Both are not very good for you. Similarly, a virus can infect the cell by colliding with the cell, and then finding the point of entry, and, in, and then infecting. We know recently that this has happened not so long ago, huh? where one had really to handle this new problem of this uh, virus which was infecting most of us and uh, in the pandemic which we uh, come, came just out of it. So the question then is, what is going on? What makes killer cells know that the other one is a cancer cell? What happens here is obviously that these bodies are made of molecules and they touch each other. And by touching molecules which uh, characterize a cancer cell, and they are on the surface of the cell, there are some molecules which are so they're sitting there, and the killer cells, they find them, and when they find them, they try to destroy them. So, beyond molecular chemistry, therefore, between, be, beyond isolated molecules, single molecules, there is a field which deals with what assemblies of molecules do. And this we have called supramolecular chemistry, which is chemistry beyond the molecule, chemistry of assemblies, of societies, of populations of molecules. And this is then a field which uh, is, of course, important in terms of what our new properties are appearing. Let me just very quickly give you an example. A single water molecule cannot boil and cannot freeze. A glass of water can boil and freeze and have a, a viscosity, an index of refraction, and so on. It's still water. But the difference is, that in a glass of water, molecules interact. And here come a lot of new properties. And so, as complexity of the system increases, new properties appear along the way. So, this is then trying to go beyond the single isolated molecule and seeing what happens when they get together. 
by interactions. For physicists, that's all the same, of course, and they are right. But for chemists, it's just convenient to try to, to sort of have a, to, to separate molecular interactions, uh, covalent interactions from the non-covalent ones. And civil, uh, then several properties have been studied over the years. One of is uh, molecular recognition, I come back to that. Also how uh, molecules react with one another when they get together, and also how they can carry one another through a membrane, like a cell membrane or an artificial membrane. What is molecular recognition? Very simple to explain that. It had already been done many, many years ago. Molecular recognition first involves binding. If you have no binding, no interaction, then you ignore. It would, they would ignore each other. So there must be some kind of energy, some kind of glue to put them together. But there is a very important property, which was probably the most important, um, uh, the most important uh, property which supramolecular chemistry uh, made apparent. Of course, it was always there, but you have to realize it is there, and this is information. Molecular systems, when they come together, they have in, they, the molecules have, have uh, information, and when they come together, they can process that information. So there is a sort of a double complementarity in very simple terms. The geometry fits together, and the interactions also fit together so that they attract or repel. And in fact, in 1894, there was already a very, very famous paper which sort of expressed that in a very nice and strong image. And if you just recall that image, if you remember this image, that's enough for the talk I give today. It is Emil Fischer, who in 1894 wrote a very famous paper when an enzyme, trying to explain how an enzyme acts on its substrate, its, uh, the compound it has to transform, he said they have to fit together like Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. And of course, if you have a lock and a key, if they fit together, you can open the door, you have a function full of wing, and so on. So this was a very, very important paper, which uh, was published in 1894. Now, the emblematic example of that is the genome on our planet of living organisms. The genome is a way to store molecular information, and in fact, it is very, very simple, even trivial, I would say. When we hear about all these magnificent machines now when they are made for quantum uh, physics, for quantum objects, for uh, all these materials we heard about, which are much more complicated in terms of uh, the st molecular structure they have, here we have just four chemical letters this means four small, simple chemical groups which have received names given by chemists, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. They are sitting on a long string in a given sequence, and this sequence is characteristic of what this information is. So the difference between a tomato and an elephant is in that string. Just a sequence of four letters makes the difference. Now, how can this be read? It's not enough to store the information, you have to be able to process it, to read it. It is also trivially simple. Two of these groups can interact by two points of attach attachment, as you see on top, and the other pair by three. So it's just a binary system, like 0101, we heard about that from Francisca earlier, 10101, one, one. here it does 2323. And this is enough to process the information which is stored in the genome of living organisms. So, chemistry, which is usually defined as the science of the structure transformation of matter, of non-living or living systems, has another property which is very important, which is, is the science also of informed matter. And this informed matter, the storage is at the molecular level of this information, and the processing is by the way in which they get together, how they recognize each other, how they find out, how they can combine, and so on. Now, this has led then to many, many studies on trying to understand or let's say to imitate molecular recognition and to make models and to have artificial ways of creating 
um, processes of molecular information. Here you have a, a cavity, a receptor in white, and you have three keys, a purple one, a blue one, and a green one, and of course one, the purple one is the one which fits. And this has then been developed in many, many laboratories because it's a very fundamental basic process. In our body, all the molecules do what they have to do because they can recognize them with another. So without molecular recognition, we would not exist. Our molecules, they do that job all the time. And it's purely physical chemical. It's nothing magic there. So there are applications, and of course one is especially interested, and the questions come up, what are the applications? Let me just show you some applications of work we have been doing, but there are many others, many other applications. First of all, as I just said, molecular recognition, that's the basis. And that is also the basis of drug discovery. When you make a drug, you can say in Emil Fischer's terms that you try to make a key for a biological lock. A key which you want to built in such a way so that it is as selective. It doesn't make mistakes to bind to something else. Of course, there are always some side effects. And so we want to make it as specific as possible so it will just go to its target and then do something, either amplify or repress the activities of that target. So that is the basis of, let's say, developing drugs or pharma industry. We have also done, we made uh, compounds which had a cavity, in, a cavity, and you can put things in the cavity. In fact, all of these things, molecular recognition, that has all have to do with a kind of a target, which is more cavity-like, and something which can go in. In this case, there was a europium ion introduced in the cavity, when the, this ion, which is part of the periodic table, of course, uh, when this sits in the cavity, it can emit red light, and serve, therefore, as a sort of a bulb, which uh, can be attached to an immunoprotein, which is the searching head, and then you can develop out of that uh, um, a process procedure for medical diagnostics. The machine you see down on the VC on the right is indeed a man, which this one over here, which is one which is used now in hospitals and has been developed by Gérard Matisse. It, uh, small French company, now it's a much bigger company. And then uh, the process of uh, leading things through cell membranes is a very important one, it's, it, because it has, it has to, it plays a role in what is called gene transfer. A gene defines a given feature, a given property, and you may like, if there are, the, is it, there are diseases where a gene doesn't function well, so you may like to, rep, to replace it by the one which functions, by the good gene. Or you may want to transform the host by introducing new genes. And that is then genetically modified organisms. And here I would like for all of you to make the strong point that genetically modified organisms are not killing us. Genetically modified organisms, we need them. We need them for making plants which resist heat, which resist drought, where there is no water and we will use them for many other things, and one can even make genetically modified animals which produce drugs, uh, and many other applications. So, don't be afraid of genetically modified organisms. They are good for us. I would also like to say a word on some materials and the properties which come out of uh, this type of supramolecular material. All materials are supramolecular, nothing new. Everything around, a, a tree, a rock, everything is, uh, has supramolecular properties because it's an aggregation of different things. But you can then specifically use these features to develop new, let's say, plastic, plastics, new polymers. And we did that. And I want just to show you also an example where one appreciates how long it can take to get an application from a basic proposal. In 1990, we proposed, uh, a, in um, a, the first paper on that, supramolecular polymers, polymers which can, are constructed on the principles of supramolecular chemistry. Okay, 1990, then things continued, many people became interested and so on. Then some people thought of making them biocompatible. And indeed, in 2013, I got an email from 
a small company, I didn't know it existed, telling me that we made from these biocompatible supermolecular polymers, we made implants, a material which can be used for implants for cardiovascular surgery in children. And this company, Xeltis, in the Netherlands, uh, and close to one of the people who uh, has specially developed all supermolecular polymers, Bert Meyer. And uh, so they use this for reconstructing the heart of children who had a, se a very severe cardiac malformation. And I show you now the picture of the first child which, who was implanted. Here is Dominica, four years old at that time, and Professor Leo Bokeria. She was implanted by him, and uh, in a way I haven't time to get into that, uh, on October 23rd, 2013, at the Bakulev Center for Cardiovascular Pediatric Surgery in Moscow. And you look, they both look very happy, huh? The same, so there are many more children than 10 now. And um, they also, the same company developed also heart valves, which have been implanted also in different, uh, re in different uh, hospitals in Budapest, in Krakow, and in Kuala Lumpur. And I am told that that is a big breakthrough in surgical practice. Now, you see, if you have developed a field, you haven't we didn't think about making this kind of things. But it's fantastic, but it took 23 years. And of course, 23 years because you have to put it into a body. And if it's a living body, you have to be extremely careful. It's very long. And some people, they have the courage to do so. The courage to hang on, that they convince that the idea they have is correct, convince that one can do it, and then you hang on and you put your sheet, your shirt on it. Huh? You have to, uh, yeah, you have to put your shirt on what you want to do. You may not succeed. Another property is that these polymers, because they w the binding, the, the, the uh, interactions between the molecules are rather weak compared to the molecular uh, the atoms in a molecule, you can make films, like here you may see a, a, a nice film, totally transparent, held by one of my postdocs from India. He holds it and somebody else cuts the uh, film. Then you, su and you cut there, you superimpose the two ends, and you just press with your finger. That was very uh, uh, simple, very trivial, because we, we just wanted to see if it works. So you s push your finger, you thumb on it, you press, and you can then stretch, and it sticks. It just takes a minute or two. Of course, you can do it much, much more nicely than that, much more in a more uh, controlled way, but it is enough to demonstrate that it works and it sticks. So, let's come back to the main, the, the main thread of what I say. After all, the important feature is self-organization. The fact that chemical objects can self-organize, leading to inorganic, to non-living entities, and of course, we are also self-organized, we don't make ourselves that the molecules in our body, they know what to do. They built, evolution has built them in such a way that they can perform the actions they have to perform or create the organs, as we just heard a, mo a moment ago, the organs from the blueprint, which is the DNA. So, let me just show you one um, example. The first uh, the virus which was understood in terms of its, the way it builds up. It was a tobacco mosaic virus, and uh, it is built of 2,130 bricks, protein subunits, which you see on the, on the right-hand side over there. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. On the right-hand side here, well, it's difficult to see, but you can see this is a more, di a more precise picture. On the left-hand side, it's probably simpler, you have just like a piece of cake, and these pieces of cake, they interact with one another, they go together, and they make a sort of a helix, and in the center there's a hole, in that hole is the genome of the virus, and that happens spontaneously. Again, it looks like magic. Nothing, nothing magic. All these processes are understood. All, the, proce all the, uh, the basic scientific principles on which this can happen are understood. Now, of course, I cannot 
refrain from calling that a program chemical system and just to let you know that in last Monday, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for the basic, it was given for the basic research leading to the messenger RNA vaccines against COVID-19. That is why we are here. Without that, you would not be sitting in this room. You would be at home, we would be confined, and this is science. This is something, and this vaccine was made in less than a year. When it happened, when this pandemic started, I said, okay, now we have it for 10, eight to 10 years, we have to be very careful and so on. No, we go around. We see each other, we sit together in this uh, room here, and this is thanks to this research done on RNA, which started, yeah, something I should tell you. The French government was quite unhappy that no French company had produced a, me a messenger RNA vaccine. Okay, but we should remember or know that in fact messenger RNA was, the Nobel Prize for messenger RNA was given to François Jacob and Jacques Monod at the Institut Pasteur. This is how science functions. You know, you, there's this discovery being made. This is then a part of the treasure of knowledge in mankind. And then lots of people work on it. Many contributions from all kinds of sites. And finally, because Katalin Kariko and Drew Weissman, they were hanging on to it. They were not sure it would work. And she was almost thrown out of the university. So that's a fantastic story. Hang on, doesn't always work. Often you can make a mistake and there's zero at the end, but the efforts of everybody, all of people together, lead to things like that. That is why we are here. And of course, one should not forget here that companies are needed. You would not have the vaccines without companies. There was this company in Germany, BioNTech, which is run by two people of Turkish descent, Ugo Sahin and Özlem Turecci, she talked here on Monday, last Monday, and this, so in fact, what did you have? A Hungarian, Katalin Kariko, an American, Drew Weissmann, and two descendants of Turkish origin. That is science. You never know where, the, where it's coming from. It will come because people are not stupid. They have imagination. There are many intelligent people around the world. There are many courageous people to hang on, and so it happens then. Now, uh, this sort of uh, self-organization, which I just mentioned, of course, you, will, you can try to reproduce these kind of processes in the lab. I would, don't want to get into that because it uh, would take a long, long time, but let me just show you some objects one can make by simply taking bricks, which are molecules, and a cementing unit which glues them together, a glue which are metal ions. So by doing that, we can have a generate a great variety of architectures, like for instance, a double helix and a triple helix. They have nothing to do with DNA. What we wanted to do is just to show that one can make double helices by design, by planning it, and then you make it, and then you get a result. And if you get a correct result you expect it, then you know you have understood the processes. Pardon. One can also make things like that, like what we call a grid, where molecules are held together in a more or less perpendicular fashion by metal ions which are present at each intersection. One can make this sort of flower-looking one, and we can also make a, a cylinder where there are linear molecules, flat ones, which are spontaneously going together. There's here, what in all these cases, what you have to do is to design the molecule correctly, and then you just mix, and you get. This is of interest also for nanoscience and nanotechnology. For instance, the idea would be that this type of computers, which is here, this you have to make it, but well, maybe in the future it will make itself by assembling, spontaneous assembling. And there is a good example for that, which will convince you the most powerful computer still around is our brain. That is why we understand all that. And you don't make it. Uh, you, it's make itself. 
You don't have to put it together piece by piece. It makes itself because there are all the processes are there which can lead to it and it has evolved in such a way. Now, uh, just one word about what we are now interested in. For the moment, I told you about designing objects, putting information, molecular objects, programming the system so that it will have a given architecture, which is a given function, which you want to put into it. Beyond that, there is another property which we can introduce, which is what about letting the system choose what it needs to build itself up? And this is done with selection, se selecting the correct bricks from a diversity of bricks. So then you need many diverse bricks, and you need also what you may call dynamics, so that when objects get together, the first collision, if it is not uh, the, most, the best one, best meaning for a scientist, somewhat dynamically the best one, then it can separate again and look for something else, so that it can sort of adapt it can optimize the final result, the product. This leads to an adaptation of the system to, for instance, changes to in physical agents. If you change the temperature, you put the pressure, you change, you add something else to it, the system may change and respond. And we call that adaptive chemistry, a chemistry where the objects are able to adapt to changes which occur and adapt to uh, different kind of uh, agents which come around and so on. And it can also be used for developing methods for uh, uh, discovering biologically active molecules and for materials and so on. I haven't time to get into all that. So the evolution of chemistry therefore starts, of course, atoms before. But once atoms get together, they make molecules. Then you have the supramolecular effects when molecules interact with one another, like in our body organized, okay, they have a given organization, which is preferred compared to another one. The dynamics are important, so as not to have something inert. If it's inert, uh, a little chance that you will optimize further than adaptive, evolutive, and this is more, towards more and more complicated, complex features like those happening in life and in thinking. Thinking is much beyond even life. Life is a simple problem compared to thinking. So, let me summarize. I do understand that I am, of course, I think I'm, first of all, a scientist. I try to be one. But considering chemistry, you have understood that chemistry is a creative science also. As I like to say, the book of chemistry has to be written, not only to be read. Of course, we have to read the, we have to read the book of, chemi of compounds developed by nature in the course of evolution, trees, plants, flowers, animals, and so on. But there are many, many, many combinations which have not been made, and this is to be written. Similarly, also the score in musical terms of chemistry has to be composed, not only to be played. So chemistry can be considered to have creative power like art. And chemistry is the art of matter, the art of making new combinations which did not exist before they were done. This has already been said in other terms, of course, and in other circumstances by somebody all of you know, Leonardo da Vinci. He was an artist. He was a scientist. He was an engineer, and he wrote a very fanta a fantastic sentence in his times. I think he probably had he written that a hundred years earlier, it would have been burned. Where nature finishes to produce its own species, we are part of that. We are part of the of the uh, what of the species generated in the course of evolution. Man begins, of course, women too. <laughs> Using natural things, natural things, what are they? The bricks of the periodic table of elements, the bricks which are this, at our disposition, the bricks which have been generated by our universe. This is what are the, the complex objects, molecules, and so are made of. In harmony with this very nature, ah, that means just the laws of physics. You cannot get about, uh, around it. You are like when you play a game, you have laws, and you apply those laws and they determine 
what you are allowed to do or not allowed to do. And then the end of it is a very, very strong end because Leonardo was an artist. And for an artist, creating something is a very, very strong term. And he did not hesitate in saying to create an infinity of species. Some people at that time, at his time, they were saying, this guy is crazy, you know? To create, who, who dares to create? There's only some people think that creation has a, appeared somewhere else and somewhat differently. To create an infinity, which is true, of species. Very strong statement. So it's not just the natural things we have to worry about and we have to be interested in, but what we can do. Coming to, back to uh, the um, mythology of Greece, in Greece, here you see Prometheus, which has stolen the fire of knowledge, again knowledge, from the gods. And he looks over his shoulder, running away, to see if the other, the other guys are not trying to catch him. But they didn't catch him, and he gave it to mankind. And here you see another Prometheus showing the fire in question, the fire of knowledge and of science. Now, a very important consequence we must realize is that we cannot give it back. What you know, you know. You cannot just erase it unless you destroy the planet totally. Well, that's an option. But there is certainly on other planets there will be other people a bit more intelligent who will not destroy themselves. So we cannot give it back. What does that mean? It means that our path leads us from the quest of knowledge to the control of our destiny. Evolution is now in our hands. We can ev make humans evolve, let's say, artificially. But one has to be very careful. I don't say that it's, that's a very complex problem, but we, have, we will have more and more the power. And when we heard about stem cells by Yamanaka, you can, in a, in a cell, there, there, all the information, the DNA is there, so everything is there. You just have to know how to use it, and you have to define how to use it, in which conditions you want to use it. This is a fan these are fantastic challenges for the future. It will be not easy to know how and what to do, but we have the power to do it more and better and better. Not yet all of it, but better and better. So let me finish with uh, a mathematician. I haven't seen much about mathematics, huh? in fact, very little. Here is David Hilbert. He is, comes also from a university, that small city of Göttingen. We heard about Göttingen before. Göttingen was uh, quite a good record in uh, advances in science. David Hilbert, he wanted to have two sentences written on his tombstone. And when you go to Göttingen, you see that. The first one is, wir müssen wissen. We must know. That was drive scientists. Huh? This drives us. We must know. Come on. We must know. The second statement is even, I would say, stronger because it's a vote of confidence. We must know. Wir werden wissen. We will know. That's a word of confidence. And of course, if you are driven by then the, this uh, push to know, at least you will, must have some hope that you will know at some stage. So here is again Prometheus holding the light of science. We will know. And for the younger people in the audience who have still their future to make, and also for the others, science shapes the future of humanity. I advocate that if you go to the beach and do some swimming, or you go to a, a tennis court and do some tennis. OK, that's fine. But I think everybody should spend some time every week to get to know more about science. Because our future depends totally on it. So there is passion for knowledge. And because there is this passion for knowledge, I think mankind has a good chance, or they were not certain, 
to know more and more, to be able to control itself better and better. And there is finally another property which science has, and which is only science has that property. Here is our piece of dust in an enormous universe turning on itself. We are sitting on that ball, and we are nothing in the universe compared to the immensity of the universe. But the creation of science, developing science, makes us all brothers, not just along uh, around the Earth, but if we meet some other organism somewhere else, water, alcohol, benzene, and all these things will be the same. So science has no borders. Science has no borders between people. Science has no flags. Science has no dogma. Science has no politics. Science is the only activity of mankind which spreads all over and which is valid not only on our planet, everywhere. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.